Although I don't see the timer anymore. So I'm guessing that we're live. And it looks like we are. Yes. Wait, oh, <laughs> All right. Let's just wait for some folks to join us here. Get yep. this kicked off. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, we've got several people joining us. Ah, bonjour from, uh, from France. Very good to see you, folks. I loved Paris when I visited uh, a few years ago. Me too. Me too. I was very excited to go finally see the Eiffel Tower. Yes. Ah, Sweden. I fortunately do not know Swedish. Uh, but good afternoon to folks from Italy as well. I always like to say Guten Tag or Guten Abend. Um, for those of <laughs> us joining us from Japan, uh, Kanbanwa. Ah, Cornwall. Good afternoon. <laughs> Probably just about a little little after tea time there. I do miss tea time. <laughs> My first time this year. I got to go to London for the first time this year, so I was very excited. Ah, love that city. Uh, in fact, every time my wife and I talk about vacationing, she says I would go back to London in a heartbeat. I didn't ask why, <laughs> um, for that matter. I ah, good evening from India as well. Um, oh, that's amazing. Uh, Ravi, what part of India? I, I used to have a team out there. I've, I've enjoyed some time in Bangalore uh, uh, for a bit. Wow, early from LA, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully you've got something uh, delicious and warm uh, to consume, perhaps caffeinated. Rockville, I've been out to Rockville area. Ah, Hyderabad, nice. Um, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with it, Ravi. So yeah, Rockville, in fact, uh, I used to work for Thermo Fisher Scientific out of, um, oh gosh, Frederick. Uh, was the offices where the CISO uh, sits. So I've, I've been out in that area as well, Jai. Yeah. So welcome. Actually, I grew up in Maryland too. So I've ah. been all over Maryland, Rockville, Frederick, <laughs> Baltimore. Great. Great. Uh, so yeah. we are going to get started here in just a minute, everybody as well. So thank you all for joining us. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so glad to see people from all over the world joining us today. We have two from Rockville. So we will be kicking things off, I believe, here um, with a poll in just a couple of minutes. Um, but we are going to have uh, sort of some intro slides that we're going to walk through today, folks. Uh, good morning to those of you joining us on the Mountain Time West Coast. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to those joining us from various parts of Europe and Asia. Uh, really glad to have you all here. And then, of course, I'm from the New England area here. So it's almost lunchtime or just after this. So... <laughs> Anyway, let's uh, let's kick things off, Sarah. So, um, quick introductions. Uh, joined here with my great colleague Sarah. Uh, it would be a little weird if it wasn't us, though, here on the call presenting. So, anyway, Sarah, I don't know if you want to do a quick intro, give you a little bit of yeah. your background and what you do here at GitHub. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Hey, everybody, I'm Sarah Khalife. I'm a principal solutions engineer here at GitHub. I've been at GitHub for about two, actually three, three and plus years now, um, which kind of feels crazy because. Uh, I feel like the time flew by very fast. Uh, before that, I was a software engineer at um, my previous company, and I worked on a lot of backend development, cloud platform applications, just deploying cloud platforms. So across the board, cloud, microservices, everything under the sun there. <laughs> um, but I'm so excited to be here today with everybody, and I'm very excited to talk about our topics today. So Keith, nice. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And hi, everybody. I'm Keith Hoodlett. I'm a code scanning architect here at GitHub. I work very closely with the field security specialist team on talking with customers about uh, specifically my area, CodeQL, but also all of the other things related to GitHub Advanced Security. Before joining, actually, I joined 11 months ago, coming up on my one year anniversary here next month. Um, wow. But before all that, I was uh, building the DevSecOps program at Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is a global life sciences manufacturing company. Um, some of the things that they're famous for is their work in genetic sequencing. Uh, specifically, the human genome was mapped on their devices back in the 1990s. And some of the response to COVID-19, uh, the very first genetic sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in Wuhan was done on Thermo Fisher devices. Um, wow. But all sorts of uh, involvement in Olympic drug testing, forensics, um, you know, blood and, soil and other sort of sample testing um, 
uh, purity of medical products testing as well. So uh, lots of fun stories at some point. If, uh, if you folks are interested in talking about more of those fun things, you can always book a meeting up at the top. It can, of course, be about more than just my fun war stories. But um, if you ever get a chance <laughs> to have a conversation, I love to share interesting tidbits, uh, usually under NDA. But anyway, uh, let's go into some of the fun stuff today, Sarah. I'll hand it back over to you. Great. Thanks uh, again. Thank you everybody for joining. Today's just part one of our three part series. Today's uh, we're talking about our introduction to developer first security. In the next couple of weeks on October 13th, we'll be talking about code scanning essentials. October 18th, we'll be discussing the benefits and, of uh, secret scanning and security overview. This GitHub learning series is for not only you to participate in and for us to present, but we want this to be as interactive as possible. We want to bring you up on the screen and talk with us. We want to have foster open conversation. Make sure that you are have your mic ready, your camera ready if you want to participate on screen with us. And we are very, very excited to have you you know, leverage, uh, we have to have you actually share some of the information that you are experiencing through today and leverage some of the knowledge that's in the room. So excited for our kickoff session today. So and make sure to, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, and you know, as a reminder, again, if you wanna join us uh, here on camera, just click that raise hand. There's like a couple of prompts that'll have you go through, but again, it's an opportunity for you to join the conversation. Um, this is meant to be interactive because I'm sure for those of you that are spending your evening with us, we don't want you to fall asleep. <laughs> uh, so all that being said, we're gonna kick off the first poll. I'm gonna actually go ahead and stop sharing here and then I'll share that poll information out, but we'd love to know uh, what you do. Right. Uh, is of course we got Sarah here who works from a more of a developer perspective, myself working from more of a security perspective. So I am going to go ahead and share that poll just to see who we have with us today. Strong representation so far from the security team. This is good to see. We're really happy to hear that. Of course, as I like to see this, it's a collaborative effort. Um, Sarah, in your sort of day-to-day -day conversations, as we have more people responding to the polls, you must talk with all sorts of different groups, uh, you know, from various customers. What is the mix that you usually see? That's a great question. So from my from my personal experience, I usually connect with a lot of developers from not only the develop, the application development side, but we also get some engineers from the security researcher side. But a lot of our day-to-day -day conversations range from developers, security researchers, CISOs, AppSec developer, uh, AppSec uh, security researchers, but also directors across the board. So it can range from our developer team to our operations team and so forth. What about you, Keith? Who do you nice. get to I mean, uh, talk to day-to-day? Admittedly, it's mostly the security people. That's usually who I get yeah. brought in to have great conversations <laughs> with. Although I will say I'm always super excited to talk with uh, you know colleagues in the development side of the house and especially leadership because um, the philosophy that I think GitHub brings to this problem is really uh, bringing you know these parties together in one place to be able to collaborate and work together. And uh, as they say with you know DevOps, it's just communication, coordination, and collaboration. And you can't be doing DevSecOps without be doing DevOps. You know, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here. But uh, awesome to see such a great representation across the board. And especially shout out to those four people from the operations side. Really, really happy to have you involved in this process. You are critical to all the things that we're doing. So thank you for joining us. And let's stop sharing that. And we'll go ahead and reshare the slides here. All right. So now that we know a little bit about uh, who you all are and what you're all doing for the companies that you work for, um, Sarah, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start, start with talking about uh, you know some of the security stuff. But please jump in. And again, as you folks want to join the conversation, as you have things that, that you want to bring up or discuss with us on camera, by all means, again, just a reminder, raise your hand. And we'd love to have you join us and, and talk about some of this stuff. Um, so first and foremost, uh, let's look at security today, right? I think we're all familiar with all you know the things I'm going to share here. And Jeremy, by the way, really glad to have marketing uh, here as well. You are also important to be involved in the process. Otherwise, how is you know how are people going to know what the security teams are doing or the developer teams are doing? Um, so. Of course, we often see this concept of more code, more problems, right? It, it's a very real thing that we've experienced. And with GitHub being that home of open source, uh, we see a lot of sort of data that happens in the open source community around how vulnerabilities get presented. Um, we see it very often in a lot of open source projects, especially some very big ones. And a really good example of that is 
uh, just and again, one example of that is the compound annual growth rate of secrets being leaked in open source projects. Now, thankfully, with secret scanning and auto rotation of some of those tokens on these open source projects, we're preventing uh, open source maintainers from experiencing very, very large AWS bills. Uh, but again, the the trending that we're seeing is you're more likely to introduce security problems over time. And so uh, again, it's it's one of those things that more code, more problems, more problems, more things that you have to go and address. And when it comes to addressing them, well, it can be expensive. Uh, I often think about, and Sarah, I'd love to get maybe your take on this, especially if, you know anyone from the audience as well that might want to join us on camera and discuss this. Um, I remember on a, a few different occasions having to work with development teams to go and fix decades old software and the security vulnerabilities associated. Um, how much, like, did you experience that in your previous role? And, and from that, like, how much time did you find that it was sort of distracting those engineers from working on meaningful features for customers? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, I'm, we're welcoming a lot of the, our audience to also participate. So please raise your hand if you're interested in jumping up on the screen with us. But um, Keith, yeah, it, I completely agree. A lot of the time, a lot of our security scanning and testing has been done in the testing QA phases, in stage and in pre-prod, or even in production, and sometimes after a breach. So because of that, I've already lost a lot of the context of the app or the even the specific feature I was developing. So going back and fixing those vulnerabilities was pretty tough. We had to work a lot with our security team to really understand, is this really a vulnerability that we need to fix today? Do we have to really upgrade our current state production instance to the latest version, or can we do that as we move um, through our newer features coming in? So it was always a tough conversation because there was always um, a little bit of friction that was caused because of that. Security was definitely looking to make sure that anything that we're producing is a very secure product. And we are too, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of work and a lot of time to take something out of production, upgrade that hot patch it, and do a lot of changes after we've already worked on it. And I already lost a lot of the context. And, you know, Edward from the chat uh, was mentioning as well, some of the challenges around updating vulnerable libraries is the question of, is this thing really exploitable? And that's such an important question to be asking. We will go into some of that later um, in the conversation. And Edward, if you want to join us on camera and discuss that at length uh, again, or, you know, uh, add some context, by all means, feel free to just uh, click the raise hand and we can bring you up on camera. Um, and, and discuss, but that is such a, a, you know, important thing to bring forward and actually, Hey, great. We had a raise hand from Edward. So we'll go ahead and bring you on, on camera here with us. So Edward, tell us more about that. Um, tell us more about that experience of, of, you know, developers having problems updating libraries. Oh, you're on mute. It looks like. <laughs> Just on the bottom, it looks like a microphone, like bottom middle. I have to configure some of the yeah, settings. Yeah, I know that yeah, sometimes. sometimes it does ask you which which microphone right. you're trying to use. Is that there you go. I think I hear you. Yeah, great, yes. great, great. <laughs> yes, uh, like you said, um, it, the problem with uh, library dependencies is there's so many and when they feel like they've done their duty and they've upgraded the uh, uh, to the version that they're supposed to be on, then they get another uh, vulnerability, and then they have also traversal, you know, uh, indirect uh, issues that pop up as well. And then they start complaining, well, you know, are we even using the method that has the vulnerability? Uh, is this really exploitable? Are we wasting our time? And then you have yep. to start balancing, you know, the value of the possible risk versus the other work they've got to do. Absolutely. And it's a, that sort of context of um, risk. I remember my, my good friend and my former boss, uh, Brian Inagaki, always used to say risk is likelihood and impact. An impact you can't really change because if the thing gets, you know, popped, well, you're going to lose something as a result of that. But the likelihood is always the question that you have to sort of weigh against and determine is this thing works worth fixing because the likelihood is either really high or it's maybe really low and we have mitigating controls, right? 
Um, so that's a really, really good point. And I don't know, Sarah, if you had something to add there, so apologize if I cut you off. No, no, I think that's, I mean, that's a great point. I feel like as a developer in my previous role, again, I was already way past some of the context of even if I know it, if I'm using that specific function or if I know that I had to update that specific code base to make that update to that specific function so I don't use that vulnerability or use that uh, specific library anymore. So it, going back, we actually had a couple of those issues, not only with vulnerabilities, but we also had it with um, the different type of dependency packages that were licensed incorrectly. So we had to go through, update one specific dependency, update a lot of our code base, go go in the, go rewind pretty much <laughs> a lot of the times, a couple months, if not even a year, just to make sure that anything that we're introducing, that we introduced at that point in time wasn't vulnerable at the time of production. And at that point, again, I already lost the context. So it's really hard to make those fixes. What I often come back to is just the importance of having really good unit and integration tests because it makes that process of updating libraries so much easier. So right? much just, better. It's yeah. just like yes. now it doesn't necessarily matter to the point that you were making, Edward. Like if you have good unit and integration tests, then why not update, right? Like even if you're not using right. the functions. So yes, that's usually uh, the first step set is uh, don't complain, just fix it. That's probably the fastest thing, you know, just upgrade the, the library. And then if it starts to break stuff, then well, we can talk about it, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, well, Edward, we're gonna keep moving. Thank you for joining us on camera. If you wanna come back on later, we'd love to have you back on camera. So thank you so much. All right, thanks. thank you. So um, thank you again, Edward, for that. We're gonna go ahead and just uh, talk a little bit about, I think the other side of the problem, which is that let's face it, there are just so many developers by comparison to security professionals, especially when it comes to application security in some contexts. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this as well in terms of just how do you keep up with that volume? Like how do you successfully accomplish, um, you know, thinking about which is issues should be addressed versus which ones uh, maybe can be, you know, put off till later because the risk doesn't make sense. Um, so again, super important things to discuss. Uh, and that being said, I did want to kick off another poll in terms of like, what's the status in your company in terms of like where and how you're addressing some of these things. So I'm going to go ahead and share that poll here on screen so that we can see uh, some of the results there. But let me just click that. And we're just going to share in terms of where you're doing your testing today. Like, are you doing your testing in dev? Are you doing it in build? Um, or is it in production? I love the bug bounty one, by the way. My experience, uh, full disclosure, former top 100 security researcher on the Bug Crowd platform. That's my 2018 MVP shirt behind me. Um, yeah, the number of times you find yeah. bugs in production <laughs> and uh, yikes, like companies have really interesting um, sort of experiences there. I realized we didn't open the poll. Whoops, our bad. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to open the poll. would love to get an understanding of where you folks are doing as much of your, your testing. I wish we had like a uh, an everywhere option here, um, but maybe we'll just say like the first place that you're doing your testing uh, from a security perspective. And Sarah, in, in your experience, you know, especially with that contextual switching that you, you sort of had to do, um, did you find that when you were introducing security earlier that it was easier for you to understand context in terms of when you needed to go fix that thing? Yeah, I would say so 100% of the time because I already had information I needed to easily make that change versus later on, I already switched to a different component that I'm, I was already working on that it wasn't as easy for me to go back and make that update. I think some of the most important things that I've learned during that process is first of all, as a developer, I never really learned what is security, quote unquote, especially when we're talking about microservices and AppSec, because uh, there are probably five to 10 microservices that you're working on at the same time. And if not at the same time, within the different sprints. So by the time you switch between one and the other, and you're working on these bigger applications that are working through all these microservices, you have to make sure that not only one component is secure, but all the components are secure. So security was a newer thing to me when I joined the industry. You don't, I didn't necessarily learn that in college as a software engineer. You, you learn that a little bit at the beginning. Some companies do provide some learnings for you, but not necessarily consistently across the board. So it was definitely a new thing for me to learn about what is security 
um, as part of the security pro as part of the secure development process. But also, when do we want to fix a lot of these things, and how do we want to fix them? Is something that I had to learn by just working through it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I totally hear you. Especially um, same thing at university when I was studying computer science, right? Like you learn the basics of building applications. And I, I can't recall how many times I would talk with other students and they'd be like, oh yeah, I never did, um, you know, like garbage collection for the memory I was allocating in my C and C++ program. And I was like, yikes, like you sort of need to do that, um, yep. especially from a security context. So um, anyway, I'm uh, going to close the poll here in a moment for those of you that want to get your last minute votes in. But uh, it looks like, you know, a number of people are doing uh, security testing in their development uh, side of the house or the development cycle. That's awesome. The build cycle also makes sense. Um, I will yeah. say, especially for those, the hard part is for those companies that are doing like six month development release cycles or one year, you know, annual release cycles. I saw that a lot with device manufacturing at Thermo Fisher. And so, um, the important piece there was you didn't want them to lose the context on those things that they were integrating. So you had to get security really, really early. Otherwise they'd get to that six month point, they'd be ready to do a release and you might actually stop that release because there's something that they needed to fix and it takes several weeks to fix it, which is an expensive delay from a, a company perspective. So, um, but awesome to see a number of people is sort of that mix. Um, for those that are doing it in production, uh, I've written an entire blog series on sort of why it's a bad idea to start there. Uh, Securing.dev, you can go read it on DevSecOps Essentials because you'll. the only reason I ever start there is if you need to get the budget and you need to kickstart the program. It's a great way to show that you have problems <laughs> and especially in a place that's sensitive to the business. Um, anyway, so we're going to keep moving here, folks. Let me just go ahead and reshare the slides really quick. Yeah, I highly recommend it, checking out a lot of Keith's uh, blogs because he talks about many different components, not only with just the overall st state of security today, but also specific components on how CodeQL will be working. And we'll be talking about that later on today, too. Thank you, Sarah. All right. So, Sarah, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, let's talk about sort of where we're going, right? Like, how do we get the security experience into the developer experience? Yeah, so in general, how can we incorporate a lot of that? How do we want to improve that developer experience? How do we want to make sure that you are seeing the vulnerabilities at the right time, at the right context? As I mentioned, there are a couple of different trends that I've seen personally from just working with a lot of the developers across the um, customers that I have, but also some of the security researchers across the customers that I have. In many cases, as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of my previous experience, experience was we're including it in testing QA phases and production phases or pre-prod. I'm so happy to see here that there's already a lot more from the, or from the uh, attendees here that there's a lot more testing being done in dev and build phases. In many cases, again, we've seen that even if we're finding vulnerabilities, we're not remediating them as fast as we can. So our goal is to really have the right context, the right time to incorporate a lot of that information that you need to know so you can make that fix, not only understanding what that fix is, but making that fix much faster. If we can move over to the next slide, uh, Keith. This is a great quote. Uh, in general, focusing on providing developer experience that enables developers to do their best work is hands down not only what I would say developers are expecting from GitHub, but that is GitHub's goal. At any given point in time, whatever we are working on from security to automation to just the get whole GitHub experience, we're focusing on that developer experience. And we have that community that we're working with that is 80 million developers plus plus, actually more than 80 million today, Top uh, fifty, top ninety percent of our Fortune five hundred companies that are, or sorry, top uh, ninety percent of the Fortune one hundred companies that are working with, um, that we're working with have contributed a lot of the feedback, a lot of our understanding of what our customers need have given it. We've taken it from our community, and we've built, really built that into our developer experience. And I would say the biggest reason that I joined GitHub almost a year ago now was because of the fact that I see GitHub treating security like another wing in the hospital. And I feel like for decades now, security has been sort of those ambulance drivers and sometimes they get thought of as ambulance chasers that bring problems to the hospital, drop them off and then drive away. It's like they can keep the thing alive just long enough to get the problem to the people that need to fix it and then they just leave. And the thing that I like about what GitHub is doing and why I wanted to join the company was 
treating security as another sort of specialist in that hospital model and having them work alongside their colleagues in development to actually get things addressed is super powerful because if, if for any of you that have ever had to experience surgery, sorry that you've had to, but um, that being said, you'll know that you've got like that surgery and then you've got the post-op follow-up and then you've got like the physical therapy to get better. And then sort of that get healthy, stay healthy piece that doesn't happen with an ambulance. That absolutely happens when you're working with other professionals sort of in that same hospital. So um, that being said, let's get off a poll here, Sarah, on just, you know, what's the relationship for your companies between uh, the developers and the security side of the house? So I'm going to go ahead and share that poll and I'll make sure to open it this time. Uh, <laughs> so that way we, we have that open and we can just see sort of how that relationship is going. And, you know, it's funny in the series that I've been writing in my blog on security maturity, Sarah, the thing that I've often talked about in terms of uh, the maturity of teams is not like, you know, the specific tools that they were using or technologies that they were implementing, but it was actually the coordination or communication, coordination and collaboration between the teams. Like yes. the stronger and the tighter that is, the better your developer experience is and the better sort of your security implementation is. Um, I love the, the, we are one team votes. That's awesome. But the working on it, right. I get it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. um, it's a reality for most people. It's tough. There's always a little bit of friction if there isn't the right type of communication channel, but also not the right understanding of what we're talking about from both sides. I think that was my main challenge in many cases where I didn't necessarily understand all the security vulnerabilities that were out there for me to, understand what I really, what I personally should be prioritizing, how I should be personally updating some of the code changes that I've been making. So I'm so happy again to see so many people are working on it. A lot of our, uh, a lot of our customers are also working on it because we all at the end of the day understand that this is a shared responsibility. It's not the developers need to make the fix, the security researchers need to find the finding. It's like, a full-blown shared responsibility because there's not one way that one developer will know everything, not one way that the security researcher will know how to fix that specific application. So if we don't share that responsibility across the board and bring that in the conversation earlier on, it's really hard to get moving and fix vulnerabilities where we really want to. You know, I'd love to get someone to join us on camera if there's anyone interested, because I'd love to hear maybe all sides of this, right? The one team, it would be great to get someone from that group if you're willing to join us on camera, just to understand like, how did you accomplish that, right? There, It seems like there are a number of people here that are working on it that maybe would benefit from some of your knowledge. Likewise, for those people that, that find that it's sort of siloed, um, why is that? Is that uh, just a challenge of scale? Is that a challenge of just not having the right connections inside of the business. Maybe it's just the the culture of the business in terms of keeping things siloed. And of course, for those that are working on it, there's many of you here. Um, I'd love to hear what you're doing, right? So if anyone would like to join us on camera, all you have to do is hit that raise hand button. We can bring you on camera just like we did with Edward. And as I think you saw, we don't bite, right? Like we're just here to, to have a great <laughs> conversation with you. Um, and we'd love to know, you know, what are, what are you working on? Um, how are you working toward it? Um, from my experience, I found that having someone in the communications effectively marketing inside of the security organization was actually super powerful. Um, Andrew or Pavan, if, if either of you want to join us on camera, we'd love to have you join us. Um, I saw Andrew's comment here. He's currently working on it. Um, you know, previously worked at a company where they, they had that one team mentality and security champions uh, program was a big part of that. Andrew, would love to get your take on it if you're willing to join us on camera, no pressure, but um, would love to hear a little bit more about that. And then uh, while we're hopefully waiting for Andrew to raise hand, um, yeah, all you gotta do, Andrew, awesome, is just raise hand, we'll bring you on. Excellent. Now, uh, hopefully, uh, Andrew, this time you'll also have microphone working. Sometimes you have to configure it and it looks like you may have like a, a camera protector on because we can't see you, but that's okay. Um, but Andrew would love to get your take on, on sort of, you know, you're, it sounds like you're working on it. How is that going? Um, what are you finding is successful? What challenges are you facing? Oh, you're muted as well. Again, gosh, we got to figure out the instructions for having people get the configuration for the microphone in the instructions. Sorry about that, Andrew. Sometimes it will pick the wrong microphone. So you might have to update the settings. We still yeah. can't hear you. Not yet. Nope. <laughs> Hopefully we can get Andrew on, on mic. This would be good. 
Um, and then also, you know, Pavan, if you want to join us as well, we'd love to get your take. If you if you're interested in joining Andrew and the rest of us on on camera, you're also welcome to join us and discuss a little bit about that. Yeah, the great yeah. thing about this, so what can yeah, there we people. go. Oh. Andrew, how did you do that by the oh, way? Okay. Love, so what what was the settings for anyone else? <laughs> it, join us it, it was um, it was in the settings, the little gearbox, because I was connecting to like the default laptop. Um, speaker, but I use my integrated speaker on my monitor, so it just had to connect to the right speaker. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so oh, Andrew, so. you said you were working on it, but you were in it in a culture that had one, that one team mantra. Yeah, like, um, I, I used to be. I used to be with Dell. Uh, I moved about seven months ago or so, but I worked with Dell for about seven years, and we worked on exactly this. Uh, you know, it was a large team, about uh, six hundred developers or so. Uh, and in, over the course of about three years, we built out um, a security program there. And I think a large part of that was our security champions to have that um, person embedded across each team um, that you could, uh, you know, you, you can't talk to every developer. It just doesn't scale that way. Um, so being able to have someone who becomes an advocate from within a team is massive. And from my point of view, me working with, say, 50 security champions, I'm able to meet with them every week on a you know one hour, half hour call, whatever people can give, to kind of let them know what's happening with the company, you know, hey, what's the latest OWASP top 10 that's coming out, what's the new NIST recommend, you know, just keep them involved in the conversation and even, you know, talking about the news and, you know, what, what, what the, the Uber breach that happened, you know, how did it happen and kind of, uh, you know, making it not just, you know, um, all about training, but more about conversation. And uh, that really helped get buy-in from our security champions. And once you have buy-in from within the team, everyone else kind of comes along. Uh, I think you have, I, I can't remember what the rule is, but you know, once you hit about 20, 30% adoption of something, everyone else starts to follow. Uh, so it's really, uh, I found that approach is what worked well. And that's what we're doing now at the, at the moment. So I'm in this role about seven months. And we're again, building out a security champion program. Uh, it's a much smaller organization smaller resources so everyone's been more time constrained but uh, the so while they're more constrained at least for me it means i'm working with like seven security champions instead of 50 so i'm able to give more time to them uh, and i kind of get the same results um starting to see traction there too where people are coming back and saying hey you know thanks for the support and you, you know building, building the goodwill uh, i think that really helps build um that kind of uh, culture uh, of security within and, and you really hit the nail on the head in terms of like, it's, it's those connections that you build, right? I think yeah. that that speaks a lot about security maturity when you're, you're building the network and those relationships and by empowering and informing them, like let's face it, developers and, and C-suite and, and the leadership see all these things happening in the news. They, they sort of freak out when, you know, the news media comes out with the latest ransomware crew hits such and such company. And they're like, are we vulnerable to this thing? And yeah. um, it, having that connection where people are like, I know who I can go ask. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important too. I, I think it's important for the teams doing their security champion. They can trust them the, the security champion themselves, knowing who in the security team they can go and speak to. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's uh, empathy is really important too. Something I believe a lot in, in terms of not just we throw um, like GitHub tools are great, uh, CoQL, depend about, we can't just throw the tools at the developers and say, right, yeah. you know, we've got a tool, go do it. You need to help them, a bit of hand holding. Um, help them understand how to read uh, the vulnerabilities that are coming out. Understand how to address them as well. You know, it, it, it's it's yeah. You know, I was it's the classic DevSecOps people process, and then GitHub is obviously a technology part of it too. So, all hand in hand. Absolutely, absolutely. That's well, great. we're going to keep moving. But Andrew, thank you so much for joining us on sure. camera as well, and, and great feedback. Hopefully, you know others as well that have joined us um, have uh, found benefit in sort of thinking about how they might again, start those conversations with development teams and and have that sort of security champions mantra of empowering people and being empathetic to the challenges that they're facing. Because let's face it, at times security can be scary. And um, speaking of which, we're going to go into that section of the slides a little bit on some of the security pieces here. Um, so we'll make sure that it's not too scary, although it is, uh, <laughs> it is here in the US, that Halloween month, you know, spooky October. Spooky. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's nice to uh, foster open conversation. I, I personally, I would have definitely benefited if we had a go-to team that we can definitely open the conversation, and have the understanding of where we're both coming from. Because I think in many cases, my struggle, again, was that there was no one way to communicate and the communication was always coming through 
a manner of you need to fix this vulnerability. It's not necessarily in the manner of here, let me empathize with you, understand there's a lot going on, what can we really work on, what should we prioritize and have that, again, open collaboration and open conversation. For sure, for sure. And again, by making this all sort of in the same place for the developers, I think is just super powerful. I and agree. Oh, to that point, ahead. right? Um, you know, I think GitHub is really trying to make a difference here. And Sarah, tell us a little bit about, you know, the things that GitHub is implementing. Again, yeah, the great component here is the empowering the developer to make the fixes not in just a couple minutes, not in a couple months. When to make sure that you're actually fixing what you're finding, because in many cases, as we saw in your one of your previous slides, Keith, their trend of vulnerabilities are increasing with the code as the code is increasing. Although developers are a lot more on more aware of vulnerabilities that are out there, they're not necessarily fixing them as in a couple of minutes or in a, hopefully in just in a couple of days rather than months. So the difference here, we're actually building things natively within the developer flow. We're making it, it part of the pull request process. We're making it a security tab under your GitHub repository because a lot of the times your developers and your teams here are working within that GitHub repository day in, day out. When to make sure that you're fixing things within minutes. So because of that pull request process, we're making it a little more focused, scoping it to the code changes that you're actually introducing at that point in time. So you can actually make those fixes a lot faster than you would have otherwise have made. And we want to make sure you're not only fixing things, but you're maintaining them healthy. So incorporating those scans and similar, um, incorporating it within the pull request, it, it makes it a little more transparent. So you're not only understanding what vulnerabilities you need to dis uh, discover and fix, but you can find those scans across the board, across all your pull requests. So then it provides that transparency of what you're expected to have before pushing to production. Anything that we're doing is trust by design. And we want to incorporate a lot of those capabilities. No worries. We want to incorporate a lot of those capabilities with a trusted background. So we're doing a lot of research. We're pulling a lot of our community in. And we're working with our security lab to extend a lot of the queries that we already have and building third-party tools. And at the end of the day, we're community-driven. As you've seen across the board with anything GitHub does, we're taking in the feedback from our community. We're supported by those millions of developers, but also a lot of more security researchers and a lot more different types of roles are coming into the GitHub realm and providing that feedback back to us, working with vendors and so forth. So if, we, yeah, now we can move over to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, my, no my worries. Trackpad's super sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> but I, de I definitely want to incorporate some of the capabilities that GitHub is providing right off the bat. So that's our mission. That's our goal. That's what we want to achieve. But what are, what do we actually have today? From code scanning, secret scanning, security overview, and just securing our overall supply chain. Anything that we're doing, we're incorporating it as part of the pull request process, bringing the developer community to help improve a lot of the capabilities, improve the queries, add more vendors to our tooling to make sure that anything that we're doing is not only focusing on one path, it's actually focusing on multiple paths because not one developer, not one company is going to have one, uh, one path to resolution. So with code scanning today, we're again, it's fully integrated. We're working with CodeQL, but we're also incorporating our vendors. So you can bring in other code scanning tools with Serif. We're working with our secret scanning organization, with our secret scanning um, tooling and bringing different organizations and different vendors again in here to discuss and understand what are the different API tokens, but also how can we work together to build a better set of token and uh, management of those tokens across the board and making sure that anything we're introducing is um, not only uh, uh, not only a secret that is real, it's not just a secret that is just equals password and sometimes it's uh, a false positive, but in many cases, API tokens, credentials for your different cloud, uh, cloud applications. And we want to provide that single pane of glass and that single pane of glass makes it much easier to talk about what are we talking about here with not only within this repository, but within this organization. We can see the trends across the organization. We can find the specific vulnerabilities that are common across the organization. And even with the types of secrets that are maybe exploited across the organization, all in one view. So it makes it easier for the security researchers and the developer or org to have that conversation of what needs to be fixed and what are some trends that we're seeing. Awesome. What are some, Keith, what are some of the tools that you've seen most successful when we're talking to, when you're talking to your security researcher team? I know I've been talking a lot from the developer side, but what are you seeing as common trends? What are your developer, what are the security researchers liking that developers 
um, are now probably leveraging if they're using some of the advanced security tooling. I'm so glad you asked because we built some slides for that. <laughs> so um, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how that experience goes in terms of like the security researcher experience. But, um, you know, the important thing is making sure that that you can get that data back to developers, right? Um, so some of the tools, I mean, there are some some really cool open source tools out there from web application security side. Happy to have a conversation with people about those things as well. Again, there is a book a meeting button at the top. Um, you can just say, Keith said to book a meeting and we can talk about these things and the answer is <laughs> we can. Uh, so definitely, again, remember to use it. Um, but again, I'm also very, very much a fan of the things that we're doing with CodeQL and that CodeQL experience because of how powerful it is as a solution. And Really, the the background that I have, I wrote a whole series on static analysis. And if you look at the last two decades, there are really just three kinds of static analysis that exist. And I, I sort of use the analogy of baking um, in, in my blog. And the concept that I have is static code analysis, the OG SCA uh, acronym before software composition analysis or supply chain analysis came into being, is really about like reading the recipe, right? It's about understanding what does your code look like? Binary static analysis. I used to work at Veracode, which is the binary static analysis tool on the market. Now Secure also does that for mobile apps today. Um, that is really eating the cake or you know eating the biscuits right it's it's not paying attention to the code it's not looking at the compilation process it's just looking at the final binary and then there is this newer process with codeql that i like to call comprehensive static analysis which is sort of like being the baker you have to read the recipe you have to follow the steps you have to bake the cake and then you have to actually see why it tastes bad and so in this case we have a, a, just a ton of data around how codeql really helps you know, customers do that. The nice thing is, is it focuses on exploitable vulnerabilities first, or as I call them, remote flow sources. So, you know, to the points that uh, Andrew and, and Edward and others have made earlier, right? Um, that concept of being able to give your developers actionable feedback and being able to communicate with them clearly about what that feedback is sort of telling them, super powerful from an empowerment standpoint. And of course, you can easily customize these things as well. CodeQL is under github.com slash github slash CodeQL. All those um, queries that we run are open source. You can go and actually look at them and see what we're doing. Uh, in fact, you can write your own CodeQL queries. I've done quite a bit of that myself. Um, so I see, Kevin, you've mentioned uh, briefly as well in terms of using the Go language. Uh, CodeQL already does. Uh, in fact, um, in this case, it's it's already a language that we support. I believe we are already rolling support for uh, Go 1.19, uh, in fact. So um, our, we already have coverage there as well. Maybe we can drop a link to uh, the covered languages, but it's a great, yeah, there we go. Thank you, John. Yeah. It's a great, um, great set of languages in there. Um, we can definitely, again, talk about like what well, languages are maybe coming. You have to book a meeting for that. So or again, remember just that there is that button there to understand like what's not publicly listed, but you want to talk about it, understand where it's covered. Um, Kevin, to your point, though, things missing from other tools. Um, I would love to have a conversation about that. We probably would spend the rest of the time today on just that topic. So I'm going to say definitely book a meeting because the local versus remote sources conversation is often why you see differences in findings and or you would say missing by comparison. Um, at a very high level, uh, local sources are operating system arguments, uh, properties or configuration file reads, uh, environment variables. Those things as like a missing concept, if you think of the threat model for what you would need to exploit to control those things, from a static analysis standpoint, if those things can be compromised, you already have a much bigger problem on your hands. And I'd love to have an actual in-depth conversation with you about it, Kevin. So by all means, again, please book a meeting, ask to have a conversation about that and some of the differences and findings between Go and other tools. Um, and yeah, Edward, absolutely. You can you can definitely yes. make a note and request us. Although I will say Sarah's on West Coast. So Edward, it sounded like you were probably from somewhere in the United Kingdom, if I had to guess based on your accent or at least the light in your background and time of day. Ah, no, Atlanta. Okay, great. Okay. Well, in that case, then East Coast, you'll definitely talk with me anyway. Um, so, <laughs> so by all means, definitely, definitely. So code scanning, right? Let's briefly talk about this uh, sort of at a quick level. So code scanning does ingest static analysis results interchange format. 
ironically, it lists Dast down there at the bottom. And Dast is, in this case, like OWASP Zap outputs to Serif format, even though it's a dynamic analysis tool, because Serif is really just fancy JSON. And so uh, it's one of those analysis formats that's now becoming a standard where we can actually ingest all that information. And the nice thing about it is we see such profound uh, and sort of impactful data coming out of the open source ecosystem on repositories and their fix rates. When I was working at Thermo Fisher Scientific, for things that were under in vitro diagnostics or research use had different timelines around how fast we had to remediate those findings. But for those things that fell outside of that spectrum, the fix rate was probably much lower uh, overall for the time frames that I would have preferred. But we also had mitigations and other controls in place to secure those applications. But again, it's, it's one of those challenges of like, are you actually fixing the problem that you're identifying? And so we see this in terms of the open source query space as well, where um, in terms of recent CVEs, we had 33% would have been identified by a default code QL query when they came out. Ironically, if we think back to just a little under a year ago, everyone talks about the log4j vulnerability. Well, Paulino Calderon, or not, excuse me, Paulino, Alvaro Munoz, correction there, Alvaro, uh, aka Pwn Tester, is part of the security lab here at GitHub. You can find his Black Hat talk in 2015, where he uncovered the original log4j remote code execution via log injection. And we actually had a query for log injection um, sitting in our experimental set because we weren't super high confident about the false positive to false negative uh, sort of ratios of that finding. So again, though, when we pulled that thing out of uh, sort of the, the backlog there from our experimental query set, made some slight modifications and log4j came out. We had a query out, I think, in a couple of days, but the open source ecosystem, Paulino Calderon from the NMAP project, had a query out in 23 hours. And it was actually really good. Um, so that's the other nice thing about CodeQL is it's super customizable and there's a lot of open source development as well. Um, so we'd love to get the, you know, the focus here from you folks in terms of where you're focusing your organization's application security efforts. I'm going to go ahead and open that poll here and then share that. Uh, oops, nope, that was the wrong poll. Let me close that poll. You know what? I might not be seeing this poll in the polling list. So perhaps we would have to get a chat-based poll. So we'd love to get your take, folks, in terms of I'll put the options. You can just give A, B, C, or D. I'll put these in the chat for you. And I'd love to get an, a sense of, you know, where are you at from, uh, you know, your focus on application security? Um, and uh, Sugna, you asked a great question. Does it have a capability of collecting code coverage percentage at branch level? Hmm. It would be dependent on sort of where you're trying to to get like a, a finding. You could probably do some interesting things with CodeQL around like code coverage and understanding. Um, it certainly tells you how many lines of code it's observed. So so to that point, we could definitely go into some some detail there in a conversation. Book a meeting with us for sure, um, because there's a lot of information there that we could discuss. Would love to get uh, from you folks willing to share in terms of where you're at in terms of um, how you do your, your sort of security. I see Kevin, uh, you know, does DevSecOps, so it's continuous. Kevin, would you like to join us on, on camera and discuss a little bit about how you've accomplished that? Um, because I'd, I'd love to, to get your take on, on what that experience has been like, um, because I know that depending on the organization, it's not always easy. You see, uh, Alyssa has, a. Uh, done a mix of A, B, and C. Yep. We see that all the time too, you know, especially with the companies that we're talking to. And then uh, Pavan asked, um, where does CodeQL get its vulnerability sources from? So Pavan, actually, um, we'll see if John can share a link in the chat, but we have a, a coverage of CWEs. And so we take the approach of um, focus on the categorical risk presented from the CWE and not the specific CVEs, although we have written some queries and we're starting to write more from a CVEs perspective. We also have a lot more coming in from you know, a mix of ABC. We have some that are doing it at the coding layer, some that are doing it at code review, which is all of these are you know, totally viable. Um, you know, Alyssa, James, Sugna, Nicholas, Manzala, Adam, uh, Kevin, would, if any of you would like to join us on camera or all of you would like to join us on camera to discuss, uh, you know, again, all you have to do is click raise hand. There are some settings that I think John pinned at the top. Um, 
and we can absolutely, you know, discuss this. I'd love to hear sort of your experience in doing that more than anything, because I think that that, that definitely has a play on how this all goes. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious to hear how it's okay. incorporated at coding time, actually. Um, and how does that feel when, as a developer, if you're coding, you're seeing a lot of the vulnerabilities? I know we usually hear around code review between CICD or a mix of all three, but usually at coding is not a very common one I've seen. So if uh, Signa or somebody um, that else that is seeing it at coding time, I would be very curious to understand how and how does it feel as a developer to work through that in that environment? And while we're waiting for someone to hopefully raise their hand and join us on camera, because we've got just a little over uh, 10 minutes or so left, Sarah, let's talk a little bit about this. And again, please join us on camera. We'd love to get your feedback on this experience of where you're plugging in security and sort of how you see that playing out in your organization. Um, you know, Sarah, I think that in your experience and my early experience in my early career, you know, I saw a lot of this, right? Security is a gate at the end. Was that sort of your similar experience as well? Yeah, I would say, again, it was post CI, it, it, well, not post CI, but I would say it's post development and build phases. It usually happened in the testing QA slash pre prod and staging phases. And a lot of the times that was the security gate to push to production. And again, many cases where we had to do testing in production, usually it was SAS testing and that those SAS tools had a lot of vulnerabilities that should have been detected earlier on, honestly, that we could have probably fixed much faster. Across the board, that was the common trend that I saw, not only my team, but across the other teams that I was working with, as well as some of my other friends and coworkers that are software engineers. And it was always a, a bit of a challenge because we had to hit that security gate. And if not everything was fixed at that point in time, then we couldn't push to production. So it usually delayed a lot of our production deployments. Yeah. And, and I saw the, you know, the same experience of like, again, the ambulance drivers, right? You, if the, if you had helped that person stay healthy over time with the extent of, you know, some cases there's emergencies, but in some cases it's just a person not maintaining their health over time that leads to the emergency that leads to the ambulance. Right. Um, and what I found was oftentimes we were catching things far too late in the process that either we had the business accept the risk and we moved forward into production with that risk anyway, or um, we delayed the development and deployment of a feature set that maybe a customer was asking for, maybe a, um, a purchase or uh, some sort of contractual agreement was missed as a result. And that was oftentimes the sort of thing that you know gave security a bad rap. I think it's why oftentimes security gets a lot of challenges from the business in terms of what you're there to help solve for. And to that point, I feel like when you can start to implement security in this way, and again, I saw Kevin as well, so, you know, stated that he was doing DevSecOps. I feel like, you know, I'd love to get Kevin if you want to join us on camera. Um, I see Signa also uh, wanted to join us on camera briefly and then dropped their hands, uh, so I just missed it. Um, but again, we'd love to get your take on on sort of. Uh, there we go. Cool. We got yeah. Signa on camera as well. Um, you know, this experience. We can have multiple right? people. Yeah, yeah, we can have more than really one. Join us. <laughs> if you want to raise your hand, jump on. We'd love to have you on. Just to have it more open feedback and conversation and leverage some of the knowledge that's in the room. Sure. So, no, welcome. Um, tell us about, first of all, am I pronouncing your name correctly? And if I'm not, please please give me the correct pronunciation. And secondly, um, it, once you've got your, your audio working, what, what has been your experience here? And I think just as well for the pinned messages, um, you'll see John's post and the public chat on joining. Uh, it looks like it does have the raise hand button link, but under the gear at the bottom, there we go. I think we are hearing you now. Yep. So, hey, uh, can you hear me, uh, Keith? Yes. Yes, yeah. you're good. Right. Um, so as Sarah asked about like how we are doing um, at the code level, right? Right now for uh, SAS testing, the security testing, we are using Sonar Cube um, as like we have integration in the pipeline level. So whenever the user and as so Sonar Cube has a Sonar Link, which is an IDE extension. So most of the developers they use it that as a part of IDE while developing the code itself. They can see if they have any security vulnerabilities or some other um, 
bugs or anything so they try to fix it and at the same time once they push the code into their branch or anywhere it's automatically we we kick off our jenkins pipelines where we have a sonar cube stage integrated so every build have the sonar cube stats uh, enabled so if the developer wants to merge that one to merge their branch to the up any other branch on the upstream so it the, they should like meet that sonar cube quality gate so unless they meet that quality gate which like sonar have cube has a zero integration uh, sorry um, uh, bitbucket integration right like a github so that if unless they pass the, the security they get uh, they can merge their code into the um, the next level branch so gotcha that, gotcha so that's where i uh, brought up this like a code coverage so usually we run our unit test case as part of our pipelines and we send that code coverage um, percentage information to our sonar cube where we have a quality gate on code coverage as well so if it's for the new code we, the user should have this many, you know, coverage, like on the new lines, the overall coverage should be this percent. Unless it does meet that quality gate, they can merge into the upper stream. So that, gotcha. that's where I brought up, like uh, if we can send, inject these uh, code coverage per, uh, percentage details into the sooner, uh, you know, GitHub uh, pull request where they can see everything in one place. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, it's um, unfortunately I don't have a screenshot of it today. I definitely encourage you to book a meeting with us because, um, yeah, in fact, it shows up right in the pull request. And the nice thing is, is you get both an output from like an action being run that shows you like the number of lines of code that have been analyzed and the way that we plug or, or hook into the compiler for those compiled applications allows you to get a really nice look at data flow and then be able to determine um, sort of all of that additional information. So, Sugna, so thank you for joining us on camera. We do have to keep moving because we're near the end here. So um, that being said, I did want to drop a couple of things in the chat as well. It, there's been some really interesting studies out of both Facebook, now Meta, and Google on IDE integration as part of the development cycle. Um, I think you might be interested to see sort of their takeaway. My read of it was it was distracting to the creative process that development entails. And so it actually slowed down their sort of productivity of those developers. That was at least my read of it. Again, different companies, different organizations have different experiences. So um, please book a meeting with us to share your feedback on that as well. All that being said, just quickly, oh, I skipped ahead a little bit. Quickly, um, just as a quick recap here, uh, this was just part one of the learning journey. We're going to be back in a little over, uh, I think, like nine days. That'll be, I believe, Sarah and I again. So please join yep. us uh, for part two of those DevSecOps or those code scanning essentials. Uh, in the meantime, if um, you could just please give us feedback, we'd love to understand you know, what you got from this, your experience, if you thought this was valuable. Um, and if you don't trust the QR code, we are going to be dropping a link as well into the chat. It is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but we're not trying to fish you. Um, so <laughs> you'll see that link from John. Um, Sarah, with that, any uh, sort of last thoughts or parting thoughts here before we uh, end for the day? Um, overall, I find this so much in more interesting and in hosting it this way because I love hearing the feedback from the developer team here, from the security researchers team here, and understand what's going on within your company. Um, I across the board, my experience is one example, but in many cases, once uh, as I said before, we're getting a lot of the feedback from our community, from our vendors, and from our customers that are constantly using a lot of these tools and we're updating, improving, and adding a lot more capabilities because of your feedback. So we're very much welcoming a lot of that. Feel, please fill out the survey um, in terms of not only what how this session went today, but in general, looking forward to hear more from you in the next couple of sessions as well. So very excited and looking to continue this conversation in the next week. Awesome, yeah, same, same here. Um, Ditto to everything that you shared with us today, Sarah. And uh, again, thank you all for joining us. It's been very engaging and, and fun conversations with you all. Please join us in just a little over, nine, I think it's exactly nine days from today. Um, we'll be having another one of these sessions. We'd love to have you back to give us more feedback. Um, and uh, Deepa, to your question, these are recorded. So I believe we'll be sending those out to those attendees as well. Um, with that, um, in the interim, as I always like to say when I end these things, for everyone that joined us today, remember to get commit and stay classy. Thank you, everyone. Love that. Bye, everybody.